The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. We have a special announcement. Jordan, please stand up. I want everybody to look at you. We should get her on camera. What do you think? Oh, come on up. Come on up. This is for the people. That, there's more people watching live than there is in the room. Yes. <laughs> she has just graduated. She is now a physician's assistant. <laughs> she could be my personal doctor. No. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yes. Ooh, that's a nice little hush. How many remember when uh, the term soaking started to enter into the church? You know, I'm convinced that uh, something that I understood spiritually as a young Christian but had a hard time explaining, when that term came out, it seemed like everybody caught on. That you drink instead of think and you learn how to feed instead of read, but it's really the availability of your human spirit to open the door of your heart. People caught on though with the term soaking, they knew it wasn't just thinking, that it was somehow opening to God and His presence, which is more of a touch, a spiritual touch than it is. And uh, I, I can remember even as a young pastor, now probably some of them were sleeping, but while I was preaching, there would be certain people that would have their eyes closed. What were they doing? With their eyes closed, they were sensing something on the message that they were absorbing regardless of the content. You know, that's a spiritually perceptive individual because all words have a source. And for every word of communication, like an arrow, and we interpret what that communication is, there is an authority, or lack of, <laughs> attached to that word. And so all communication has authority of one type or another, good or bad, and being able to discern that nature. But soaking when it infiltrated the church was a, a, a milestone of getting people back to the presence of God more than just his thoughts, more than just words. It reminded me of uh, that, uh, what was My Fair Lady, what was the book actually? Pygmalion? Pygmalion, where she was a little gutter snipe and, and uh, Henry Higgins taught her to articulate and sound like she was high society. But when she got frustrated with him, she goes, words, 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 words. If you love me, show me. I believe the Lord's saying that. You can, you can have, you could be scripturally literate and you can go words, words, words. But basically the essence, the essence of it is the love nature. If the love nature of God is not on it, what difference does it make really? You can have all the right answers and a wrong heart. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. So you have to know that that is a distinctive possibility, isn't it? You can give the proper answer without having the heart for it. And uh, uh, Jennifer, we're going to pray for Jennifer today. Just extend a hand toward her. She's going to be on Sid Roth without me. For, for, she's going solo. First time on Sid Roth without me. But guess what? It's all facts and figures, and I'm, I, don't, I don't stand a chance. I go, a long time ago, this happened. Jennifer goes, October 16th, 1674, on a Friday afternoon. Yeah. All right, I don't do that. I go, a long time ago. But she's going to give it on, Satan is a socialist. That ought, to get some, that ought to get some hate mail. But you know what's beautiful? I've got to stick this part in there. Is that okay? 
Because this, she don't know what I'm going to say. She goes, I, I can't. you're on your own, bud. <laughs> but um, after researching all of this material, um, one thing stood out to me that I just fell in love with. And that was, um, and probably a lot of people won't even know who it is, but uh, Adam Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, whether people know that or not. But our founding fathers used, he's the father of economics. They used his, and you know what? It was Bible-based. It wasn't just free enterprise. It wasn't just capitalism, which actually has a negative connotation. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it was on the love commandment. And I just felt that was so beautiful. He was a theologian as well. And our founding fathers used his criteria for free enterprise and the, and the formation of this country. And uh, it was based on the second commandment. Now we know you love the Lord your God with all your heart, but you love one another, you love others as you love yourself. So he defined self-love as a, a, a healthy self-love as you take care of yourself. You're to be a steward of your own life and those that are under you, of course. And it says that to love yourself is to take care of yourself. And one of the ways you take care of yourself is you see the needs in your brothers and sisters. And the illustration, I'm using this illustration, suppose as a believer you want to practice that second commandment and you see someone who's arthritic hands and they can't button, they can't hypothetical and you out of the creativity of the heart the, out of the God initiative with compassion invent and creativity comes from the spirit creativity of your spirit comes forth I'm going to develop snaps then you are being compensated for your investment in snaps you're blessing your fellow man and then the invisible hands of competition come in and people say, kind of like Henry Ford with the car, uh, at first only a few could afford an automobile. Let's uh, develop an assembly line. Let's find a cheaper and let's use the wisdom of God to give us a more competitive approach to this and it can be available for everybody and competition makes the price come down benefits more people. There's your love commandment. How do you bless more people? You bring that price down through competition. You make it better, bigger, smaller, cheaper, whatever it takes to be a blessing. To We were blessed to be a blessing. But I just love that, that uh, he's known for his book on the wealth of nations, but he really personally in his own life, he would have liked to have been known more for, as the theologian that he was. And uh, isn't it nice to know that the founding of this country was built on biblical principles. You know, our three branches of government comes right out of, where's that at, Jennifer? Isaiah. Isaiah. Oh, you don't have the chapter and the verse? <gasps> <laughs> right out of Isaiah. For the Lord is our king, right? Our king, as executive, be the executive, our judge, Supreme Court, and our lawgiver. lawgiver which would be our legislative branch. You see, I think enough people don't know that we've taken so much God out of our education that we're not even aware that that was a premise, that that was a foundation. And yes, there's good and there's evil people in, in, in every walk of life. But the point is, is to know that there was an initial assignment by God to love other people and to be a blessing. And this country went from ox cart to the moon in a very short period of time because of the free freedom in the country to allow that creativity to flourish and healthy competition to flourish. So I don't know, I'm just, uh, uh, now Jennifer's going to take the other side of that and she believes that uh, socialism robs, kills, and destroys, but it, come, it has to be attractive. And so uh, it'll come in the form of social justice, environmentalism. Uh, it'll come in a, in, a, in a package 
to try to stir up your compassion. But the bottom line is it's not going to stir up your compassion. It's getting the camel's nose in the door to rob, kill, and destroy. And that can be any, anything from killing human lives, which R.J. Rummel has given Jennifer the permission that his life work of gathering statistics of what it's done around the world as far as murder. And that's basically the essence of it, murder. And murder can, in its mildest form can be just plain hatred. You see enough of that in the world right now, don't you? You want to have the eyes of Jesus, you've got to have the heart of Jesus. And you can't participate in that level of hatred. And God's basically saying that rob, kill, and destroy is the motive. Even if you rob someone of the initiative to use the creativity that God put them in them, it's murder. Hmm? And murder is, and killing are two different things. Murder has to do with the destruction of innocence. So, anyway, I got my two cents in there. Being, I'm not going to be on Sid Roth this week. Only Jennifer's going to be on. So I just have to give my little spiel. So, but today, Father, we just uh, bless the, the work that we have in the days ahead. And I pray for Christians everywhere to have a Christian worldview. Not every Christian has a Christian worldview. And so, Father, uh, when I got saved, all of my concepts were almost immediately washed out. I want to pray that for other people. Push back the powers of darkness. Let's pray together. Push back the powers of darkness from around people's minds so that they can make a free will decision. That they can be free from external demonic pressure and they can make a free will decision. Push back the power. Jennifer prayed that for her, her lawyer brother. And by golly, he got a bunch of bad theology out of the system where he, was being, where he was studied and got some healthy. But she prayed and prayed and she was, uh, did a lot of carpet time praying that, oh Lord, help my brother break free. Push back the powers of darkness from around his mind that he can make uh, a clear decision for himself. Let that mind be drawn to the mind of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, this morning I'm, I'm taking today off. And Jason's preaching this morning, so we're going to have him come up here. And let's just extend a hand toward Jason. Father, we just pray that you who began a good work in him will continue it. And before he starts, i got to tell stories, because I'm not preaching. Jennifer's doing our solo this week. Jason's taking my pulpit. So I just want to say... What he's doing right now was fulfilled at five years of age. I led him to the Lord. And he was in his room crying. Uh, he don't like to hear that now. But he was in his room crying, and he was about six or seven, I think, at that time. And he had a dream. And he, Jason's very quiet. He's not a talker. And he says, I had a dream. And I go, what was it? And he says, Here's, this is for you people that use a little bit of your prophetic gift. He said, I saw blue steps going up to a big pulpit. And you know how I hate to talk? I go, yeah, I know how you hate to talk. He says, and I was walking up these steps. And you know how I hate to talk? I go, yeah, I know how you hate to talk. And I got up to these, and there was this big Bible. And I went, and you know how I hate to talk? I go, yeah, I know how you hate to talk. I think there was a root issue there. You know how I hate to talk? Yeah, there was this big Bible. And then he started crying. He says, and the presence of God flooded the bedroom while he was telling me. And he said, well, you know, I hate to talk. Yeah, 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 okay. He said, when I spoke, fruit was coming out of my mouth, apples, oranges, pears, pineapple. He said, but when it was hitting the people in the chest, it burst, and they burst into tears. It burst, it touched their hearts. It melted their hearts. Hearts melted by the fruit coming out of his mouth. And I said, well, you're age five. I'm going to tell that story and embarrass you 40 years from now. <laughs> but anyway, so be it, right? Huh? Yeah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Amen. <clears throat> can, can everybody hear me? A little quiet. 
Is that, is that good? Okay. <laughs> I'm not embarrassed about that. That's actually what I would really like. You know, that's, what, that's what I desire. I would desire. Um, it's, it's funny. Uh, well, <clears throat> we've been going through a, a period in, in our, our family uh, for about since Emmy was born of no sleep and, um, you know, very little and what have you. So I blame that on any, any weird th- theological statements I make that you might feel like I'm needing concern with. But, um, but anyway, uh, the Lord, over the period of, I don't know how many years now that I've, we've been working with other, other people and, and um, the people on the online school, and I have, gosh, we have close to 3,000 and some people on the online school now, which is really, really neat. Yes. And we get some incredible testimonies, which we periodically should print out. And, and, I, and I think Ashley, Miss Vicky, she, she does have some of those every once in a while, goes through them. And they're just incredible. And they're, and they're usually the same. I mean, they're, they're on the same vein of, I've, I, I've lived in the, you know, I've been in the church my whole life for 40 years, 30, 40 years, and, and I've never heard this, and I wish I had this teaching so long ago, you know, which is really cool to hear that, um, that they actually get it. And we found, you know, we, we, we discussed last week about um, some, of the, some of the reasons why people don't get it and the, and the few that do, uh, we don't want to fall through the cracks, so to speak. We have last week's message that you need to refer to, refer all your friends to if they are, you know, have any questions about the ministry and what have you. It was so easy to, 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 to listen to. I don't know if you guys all heard it last week and, and watch it, rewatch it. Um, really get it down into your spirit. It's, it's the simplicity of Jesus is what we're presenting in our ministry. It's the simplicity of Christ in us. And, um, and that was just like perfect for la- last week. was just perfect, especially for people that are online, on the online school that um, may be struggling or whatever. I'm going to put it up there too for free so you guys can watch it on there. It's on YouTube right now as well. But um, some of the things I learned as well is, is um, not really getting into the, the message yet, but a couple of things. Um, that Gwen and I have even realized with people that have come to us or people at the online school that struggle or, or what have you, there's, there's, only war, really one, there's only really one thing that keeps you and prevents you from progressing in your maturity with the Lord, and, and that's really us. <laughs> that's, that's me and you. That's our will. The, God never, he never, he never pushes us. He never makes us do anything you know how, how boring that would be if, if he gave us you know this life to live and told us everything to do all the time I- exactly how to do it what you know and then if we did we stepped out of line or whatever we get crushed or, or you know punished what a terrible life that would be but what's really cool about you know the lord is is that that free will experience that he wants us to experience life he wants us to make hard choices, good choices, bad choices. He wants us to learn and grow, you know, and, and, and maturity. He wants to see himself through us. And, you know, he wants to see us growing and, and, and maturing and, and, and being a better expression of Jesus' son. And that's, that's why he, we have free will, because we couldn't, he couldn't do that. He couldn't enjoy us maturing and growing in him um, if, he, if we always were just walking around like robots, and we're not. Amen. But the, that's the thing that we, our will we struggle with the, the fact that we have, you know, the ability to stop God from working, or the ability to allow Him and yield to Him to work. That's our will. And for whatever reason, you know, the amount of yieldedness and the amount of surrenderedness. The, is equally proportional to the amount that you're going to mature in Christ and show His Son through you, which is which is what He wants. So when you get our will in a way, it's just a, it just gets in a, it's just, it's a mess. Um, but anyway, and that's just it's just us. It's just one thing, one thing. Anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about this today was something um, that's been on my heart for a couple weeks, and then we talk about it a lot 
Um, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about discernment, the prophetic, and the mind of Christ, or the, the heart of the Father, um, and how closely they, they are related and tied together. And we talk a lot about discernment because my dad and I are both very, very discerning. Um, but I wanted to explain a little bit of, about discernment that might not be in mo some of the other teachings. We have volumes. In, if you if you are interested in discernment, we have volumes of, of material. <laughs> out there on YouTube and also the bookstore. Uh, go for it if that's your thing. Um, but everybody has a, an element of common discernment, right? Common discernment, you don't even need a, an, an anointing for common discernment. That's, you go to the grocery store, you smell something funny, you look down and it's a rotten potato. There's a, there's a, it's easy to discern a rotten potato from a good potato, right? That's common discernment. Everybody has it. Some people don't have that great <laughs> common discernment, but you know it, it's got to be developed over time as you age. You know, I mean, my my kids wouldn't know the difference between a rotten potato and not, not yet anyway. But it takes maturity, just like just like discernment in the of spiritual things. Um, real discernment or spiritual discernment is based on communication and relationship with the Lord. In fact, most any of the giftings are, are matured in that process. You, they're based on your connection, your, um, your intimacy with God, your relationship with the Lord. If they're, they're based on anything else, they're going to be really filtered through uh, a nasty filter, basically, uh, an immature filter. Um, and what happens then is you have the difference between true discernment and then false discernment, or we like to, I mean, we've, we've talked about it a lot from the pulpit, especially my dad. Um, there's a difference between discernment that's rooted in love and then a discernment that's rooted in, in, in like mistrust and fear, which is the opposite, you know. Um, you, you, you kind of have a, you can, you can perfect either one, right? Which is really scary because there's a lot of people that think that they walk in really good discernment, but in reality they're, they're, the, they're real cl critical thinkers um, and most of their discernment is based on suspicion, based on past experiences, based on whatever you want. Now the giftings, what the Lord was showing me is that they're all rooted in love they're all looking for love in the, in, in, in the, so if I was like looking at somebody and I said, you know, Terry, this is, this is something, I see the good and the bad, right? We, 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 that's discernment, you see the good and the bad. But when you take one, you know, and true discernment is, I see it because I, I, I have the love of the Father in me and I, I'm looking at him. But I can feel it right now, man. <laughs> Ah, but you see, it's like that's the love of the Father in me that's rising up and, and bearing witness to His Spirit, which is killing me now, right now, man. Just let it go. Drop that, let it go. Um, there, that's, that, that's better. The... Um, but you need the love of the Father. Everything, every true discernment, true prophetic, true any of the giftings that, that God provides us has to be rooted in love because that's, they're all expressions of love uh, from the Father. And they're made so that they would draw all men under him, unto Him, right? So it's like, you know, we, t we talked about, you know, peace is love resting, you know, and, and all the, the, the things that my dad walks, you know, walked us through several times in different, different, um, several different teachings. I finally got it. You know, I'm finally getting it. Like, like I understand the, I understood it in theory, and I'm like, yeah, this is great. But there's so much more to discernment than, than just seeing the good and the bad. Like, if you're looking, if you, if you look at discernment, and you're looking, uh, and one of the easier ways to put it would be like, I see in the, in the garden there is the tree of good and evil, 
and then there is the tree of life. The knowledge of good and evil is, in a way, it's discernment. It's, it's a, it, you can see the contrast between good and evil. But the one step that God wants, that, that, that is missing is that he's, he wasn't in it. Although he is aware and he knows those things, he's not in that thing. He was in the tree of, he's like, that's the tree of life over here. And so when we're looking at, at, at the situations where, you know, somebody wants to discern something or somebody wants somebody to discern, you know, and they come to us for, for, for prayer or counsel or whatever, and they say, please tell me you know, what's going on in me or whatever. It's super easy to see the bad. It's super easy for a lot of people, especially if they're, they're relatively discerning and you sit with them for a few minutes. You could see the, the negative side of every, you know, those things. You could look at and, and watch just about any movie and any show on TV or any news broadcast and see the negative side. It's not that hard. And, and it's even, and it might be a little bit harder to see the good but even when it's not, and, and you're like Terry, like almost perfect, or Jennifer, she's, she's like, the, she's like the, the poster girl, right, as a perfection. Hey, it, it, it sometimes it's harder to see the good, but it's still not necessarily God. And what, what, what we have to learn as, as very discerning people, like my dad and I have to learn, and I have to keep reminding myself, is because I'm a very empathetic uh, sympathetic, uh, I cry when you cry, I cry when you don't cry, I, I, cry, I cry when, you know, I cry all the time. Um, I'm not, I guess I'm not proud of it, but I'm, I'm not not proud of it, I don't care. I like emotions, I'd rather feel than not, put it that way. Um, but the, the thing is, is like, the discernment, it, it, they, they you have to pull, you want to pull the gold, the gold out of what your, what your situation is or a person, right? So they come to you, you see the good, you see the bad. You see the, the tree of good and the knowledge of good and evil. But where is God? What is he doing? How does he love this person? How does he want to love this person? What, how does he see this person? You know what's really cool? is the, besides the fact that I have like barely, I have like no notes because I had a really rough week. <laughs> What's really cool is God is doing it anyway, right? So anyway, <laughs> back to the, the, what's really cool is that God sees us because he's not even, he, he, he's outside, he sits outside of time. He sees, he's seen the beginning and the end, you know, and he sits outside of time. He knows us from before we were born till now and forever. It's just, it's a, it's a hard concept for us to, to grasp sometimes, but what's really cool is the way that he loves us is, is the same way. He loves us infinitely with looking at each and every person as if, as if they were completely for him, 100%. Everything, every part of your being Every, the, 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 the way he sees us that way, as if we were 100%, no matter who we are, saved, unsaved, in sin, in church, he sees us that way. The most, the, 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 at the most uh, surrendered and the best of our, uh, what we were made to be. And he loves us like that all of us, not just the people that are being good Christians, but the people that have never even heard of the Lord or have denied him. They, he still, he, he sees them. He died for them that way. It was the joy that was set before him. And he loves like that. So when you are looking at somebody and you're saying, she's just a Jezebel, or so-and-so has such a such a problem and then you go that's even better you go to the pastor I have a check in my spirit about that person do you know you just you just ruin that possibility of a, a, a perfect relationship you may have if of course my dad didn't take you if he took you serious 
I mean, really, how many times have we, I mean, I grew up in the church that that was what, that way. I got to check in my spirit about this. I got to check in my spirit about, this. you know, what's, what's wrong with that is, is relational. What, so, so, okay, it affects you. you. There's a negative oof, and it, and it hit you and it made an impact of somehow, and you know it. What is God doing? What does God say? What does God want that person to hear? Why is that person here? Have you, have you guys heard about that? Have the, the, the little, I got to check, I got to check. What do you do with it? What do you do with it? I learned, I mean, as a, as a, as a, as a young boy with, with pretty decent discernment, even when I wasn't doing real well, I used it as street smarts. I used it to navigate. It wasn't, it wasn't that I was like, you know, I, I can look at somebody and say, they're a good person, they're a bad person, they're a good person. They're a good person. It, was, it was so that I didn't have to, that I wouldn't get beat up. You know, I, I, it was a rough school when I grew up in, in kind of a rough neighborhood. So I used my discernment as, as a navigation tool. When I felt the room start escalating without anybody saying anything, I would meander to the hallway. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, then the tables would start flying and chairs would hit teachers. And, um, so I used it as, as but, but that's the mere, the bottom of, of, of what God wants for us as far as why we have those tools. You know, and, and those are natural tools, but the spiritual side of it goes even further than just discerning God in that person. You have to take what, what God is speaking about them, what, what is going on, and, and, and really listen. Lord, what, what, is it, what is it that you would want me to say? or what, How do you want me to draw you? How do you want me to d- draw you out of them? Or how do you want me to... to to, to bless them? How do you want me to make them feel loved and, and secure? And, and, this, and, and we, do it, we do it all the time, and I repent over and over again for the, 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 the silly judgments. Silly judgments based on past. We, we come across a lot of people in the ministry, and it's really easy to pick up on patterns and, and, and things of, of certain aspects of people that are in trouble, right? It's real super easy. And so you could, uh, you could really easily follow, you know, fall into that, well, I see this pattern. Instead of relationally, I feel that because everybody is unique and he loves us all uniquely, he raises us all uniquely, we have to continually, no matter what the pattern looks like, always allow God and to, to show you how to get to those types of people. You can't just say this works for everybody or this, this is something, this is a tool I can use and, and fix this person with. That's terribly wrong. Don't do that. <laughs> just don't. Um, and that's, that's where like the false discernment, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a tie-in with false discernment and someone who doesn't ever um, require healing themselves. Or they know they do, but they just don't. And they, they hear all the messages and they get all the teaching and they, they go to all the seminars and they gather information and it's always for somebody else. There, there's, that's, not, that's not discernment. That's a, a loving, noble attitude because you like to help others and we're told that we need to help others, right? That's part of love and charity. But if you never allow yourself to be self, you know, God examined, our our perception of the of the world is based on our condition in our heart. It's just the way it is. So if we don't start with love, we don't start with the heart, we don't start with the correct source, our perception is worthless and really a waste of time if you're trying to fix people. <laughs> I just want to be honest. You might get through to a couple, but it's just not going to. You have to work on yourself first. 
I, I'm not even saying try and, and do everything right that the Bible says. Or I'm saying work on yourself by allowing Jesus in you to shine through, to get out of the way, to work on yourself by, God, if there's anything that's coming between you and I, remove it. Show it to me. Shine your light on it. I repent until I get peace. Then go to somebody and say, can I share something with you? You, you, you don't try to fix, just don't try to fix people, especially ones that don't want to be fixed. It's, you know, you get the Pepe Le Pew thing with the, the get away. One of the things that I learned um, just recently too is, and, it, and it, this is, this is, it's, it's simple, it's, sim it's so simple, but we, we talked a few times, I've heard my dad talk about prevenient prayer or forgiving ahead of time. And, you know, I use it for our, our oldest daughter. Our oldest daughter, when she was a teenager, and I woke up, every time I woke up in the morning and I had to drive her to school, there, it was just, it was very hard to put it that way. It was just simple to put it that way. It was really hard. And so I learned that if I wake up in the morning and I, inter and I do intercession and I release and I receive, you know, release forgiveness to her ahead of time. She didn't do anything yet, but I released ahead of time. It was like, it worked. And I, and, and for the most part, the, it, everything calmed down, the house started, you know, stopped exploding and everything started coming down and, and, and we would have a good, you know, good, good ride to school. And over a period of years, it eventually leveled out and was really great. I didn't understand why that worked, though, because I was like, that's kind of cheesy. I thought it was kind of cheesy until I read it in the scripture the other day. And I was like, oh, God, this is silly, but Jesus did this on the cross. He forgave ahead of time for everybody. I mean, that's kind of a duh. But he even taught it in, in Luke, uh, I think it's Luke chapter 12, verse 10. L let me read it in context. It says, I say to you, whoever confesses me before, before him will the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he who denies me before them will be denied before the angels of God. And everyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man will be forgiven. He was teaching, he was teaching his people to do the same thing. He was like, this is what you should be doing. As an, as an example, I'm doing, it, I'm doing it as an example himself. He did it. I'm forgiving ahead of time. And when you walk in that, that, that style of forgiveness, you, you don't have anything, nothing to pull out of you, to twist, to turn your, you know, we got so many buttons that we need removed that, that people have, <laughs> that either we were self-inflicted buttons or <laughs> created by family members or what have you. But there was nothing in him. But it was a continual lifestyle of living in forgiveness. Just like he saw, he sees the, the ultimate you, the way that you were designed 100%, no matter what area, you're, you, you know, what, what timeline you're in in your life, he looks at you and sees that person. And that's how he loves you. It's incredible. It's incredible. Now, I don't know about you, but when I move from discernment to the prophetic, of course, you, you still have to have it rooted in love. All the gifts need to be rooted in love before they can be completely, I mean, truly real. But for me, I, I grew up in a, in a, in a um, I took a lot of, well, even when I went to Bible school, and I'm not, I'm not dissing the Bible school, but the, the main thrust of, of the prophetic was uh, a little bit uh, Pentecostal holiness and what have you, but some of the prophetic, the, 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 the kids were just, we were almost trained to be afraid of the prophet, right? Because we were like, this is, this, we look at the prophets of old in, in the Old Testament, and you're looking at people that are, some of them are just crazy, running around naked for I don't know how many years and sleeping on their side for 30, you know, I don't know, Isaiah was just out there. Awesome, though. But, the, but we were always afraid that 
because what, what, because of what reason were we were afraid? We were afraid that they would discern the good and the bad. They would call us out on the carpet for the bad in front of everybody, and then punish us, or tell us what we were, what we did wrong. Tell us we need to get right, or are going to go to hell? Basically, is what we felt. It might not necessarily been what they said, but that's what we felt. So we ran from the prophet. The prophet's going to come. There were several that came through our, our Bible school, all different affiliations. But every time, the kids were the same way. <laughs> They're going to read my mail. I don't want them to read my mail. Tell them what your Bible school is known for. What do you mean? Oh, well, see, just like I grew up in, in, in semi-ghetto area, <laughs> I, got, I got sent to Bible school by God because it was, it was a dream I had and it was confirmed and, I, and it was the best thing for me. But it was for, it's for, it was for hard cases and very problematic people. <laughs> <laughs> Pastors, kids, cops, kids, gang members. Um, I didn't have any gang leaders. I think we we had gang members. You know, some one of the, one of the kids was was in jail for beating his girlfriend with a Bible. <laughs> <laughs> so he was very, had a lot of spirit of religion on him. No, he really he really did. He was a very scary dude. Very scary dude. Um. But anyway, <laughs> but, but the thing was, is like we were afraid that, that, that they would be calling us out. And even when I grew up in my dad's first pastorate, I was, I was a little bit afraid of being called out on the carpet for whatever sin I was in at the time and, and being exposed. And, and you know what? That isn't prophecy. That is discernment. And you need to be, as a, if you're saying you're a prophet or you're a prophetic or you're moving to the prophetic, you need to have a redemptive side to anything that you say. Otherwise, I ain't listening, for one, and you shouldn't either. But for the other way, because if you, if you are in the, in the, and you move in the prophetic and, you don't, and you're disconnected from the heart of the Father, that's, that's just, it's just bad. That you're, don't. And, and the thing that gave me a little bit of relief, so to speak, because um, right now, I mean, we're, we're going through a really tumultuous time in, in, in history um, in the United States and all around the world right now, but primarily in the United States with all the stuff that's going on. It's, um, very hard, but yet we're seeing a lot of the prophetic um, come out of the woodwork, so to speak. Everybody has a word about something, and everybody has a word about whatever. Um, I'm not saying to be, you know, be fearful of what you're hearing and all that stuff. Um, but if there's no redemptive side to what you're listening to, it's not worth listening to. It doesn't have my father's heart on it. I mean, just putting that out there. There's a lot of great names and, and people that I will not name that are, are very legitimate in what they're seeing. But if, but if they're missing the heart of the father for his people, and what he's going to do in response to, then there's, th it's not worth listening to. You can, you can pass on it. I'm just saying, uh, that you got my permission. <laughs> you have my permission. Um, you don't have to degrade them. You don't have to post something nasty about them or anything like that. That's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying in order to keep yourself nice and clean and, and right before God, you, you listen to the people that have a redemptive solution to what's going on. A heart of the, the heart of the Father behind it, or don't listen to it. It's not worth it. Okay. But it, but when you do that and you make that a, and you make that decision and that determination, you will you will feel so much more freer, and you'll start to hear what God is really saying, because what that's what they're they're missing. You can discern as a prophet. You can discern good and evil, just like I said. But if you're if you're only focused on what's what's horrible. And you call people out on it, or you're calling out the, you know, if you're, you know, a big name prophet to the nations or whatever, and you're, 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 you're pulling out all the negative stuff, no matter how correct you are in the, what you saw, you're wrong in spirit. Amen? It doesn't matter how correct you are. It doesn't matter facts and figures. 
if you don't have the right spirit, you don't have the right source. And one of the things that I, I wanted to, to that, that's, all, that's also something I wanted to, to play for you guys. I want you to hear something that, that a lot of us actually have heard probably on Facebook, but it was uh, Kent Christmas. Um, I don't know if everybody knows him or not, but if you haven't heard the, the prophecy from Washington, D.C. that he did, I want you to listen to this. I, I got it on, on the video. I don't know if we can play, we can play it. Um, and just, I mean, if you want to, close your eyes and see if you can feel the heart of the Father on it because there aren't very many out there right now. Some of them are so doom and gloom. But listen for the heart of the Father. Even if you don't agree with everything he's saying, listen t in, in, in your spirit and, and try to feel what God is, is trying to speak to his children. By the authority of the Holy Ghost, we take dominion today over the powers of darkness that have ruled over our nation, and we command them to be broken in the name of Jesus. For this is the hour of the church, says the Lord, and not the hour of man. And by the end of this year, says God, the greatest outpouring that you've ever seen is going to hit the United States of America. Starting January 20. In this year, hallelujah, God is going to begin to declare that there is a release of an unprecedented move of the Holy Ghost like we've never seen in our lifetime. Thus saith God, I'm coming after the strongholds that have ruled over this nation for decades, and I am pulling them down by the power of the Spirit of God. For the violence that you see in the land and the roaring that you hear over our nation is demon spirits that are crying out because the angels of the Lord have come to silence them for this hour. And just as the world has put a mask on the church and just as the world has put a muzzle on the people of God, the spirit of intimidation that has risen against the church, I, the Lord thy God, now I'm going to take that spirit and I'm going to put it on the world and the heavens that have been brass, says the Lord, I'm breaking up by the power of the Holy Ghost. For four years, saith God, from night to for 2021 through 2024, this is the last final harvest, saith God, that is going to hit this church. No demon will be able to stop the glory of the Lord that's coming. Get ready, says the Lord, for the holiness of God is coming up in this hour. And I, the Lord thy God, will take no back seat to a man. For what I'm getting ready to do, says the Lord, will not be known by personality or name, but it will be known by the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to pull down strongholds over this nation. Sports will not recover, though they say they will. Theaters are going to remain empty, saith God. And the church is going to begin to fill up and the glitter of sin that has drawn the sinner to the world is now going to be tarnished and I'm going to cause the church saith the Lord to rise to her feet. There is a roar of the line of Judah saith God I'm going to release divine healing upon the nation I am also coming after a generation of young people that have never been in church never known God I'm going to invade the homosexual community and I'm going to set them free by the power of the Holy Ghost. There is anointing, saith the Lord, that I am releasing over this nation. Just as the laws have come out of this city in the natural, saith God, so now is there a law being released out of heaven that says my church will not be silent for though I am raising up, hallelujah, mighty men for the spirit of Jesus. Isabel has ruled over this nation for a century, but I have raised up an Elijah anointing, saith God, that's going to break the spirit of Jezebel, and there's going to be peace in the land. There's going to be silence amongst the liberals, saith the Lord, and I'm going to put a war in the mouth of my people, even to the age of young five and six-year-olds. The glory of God is getting ready to come down. 
down upon this nation. Give a shout, saith the Lord, for I have not forgotten thee. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. In 1906, William Seymour said this, there is another revival coming about a hundred years and it, the bloodline is going to cross the color line. Hear God today. This is not about color. This is not about culture. This is about the church. And God said the church is my body. So today I release healing into you. I release a spirit of boldness upon you. Yet come against the spirit. Rise up, saith God. Whatever you bind, I'll bind. Whatever you loose, I'll loose. For greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is a liberty, saith the Lord. I am releasing over this land. And it is a harvest of souls. Your churches are going to fill up. Your children are going to praise the Lord. Your bodies are going to be healed. Because I declare it, saith God. And it shall be done, saith God. You guys feel it? Yes. It wasn't just because he was yelling and screaming, no. but it was the heart of the Father for his children, his church, right? What's really neat was we had this, we had this circumstance happen this, earlier in this week, and I really felt like God was speaking, it, was speaking something to me, and, and I couldn't figure out the, the, the last, I mean, we, like I said, we were going through a lot of stuff, just for a family anyway. And a lot of the pastors got hit with things and, and different stuff that was just nonstop, so to speak. And we talked a little bit last week, I think, I don't know if he actually mentioned it last week about how, you know, we, we have a certain responsibility. We, although we are, we are abiding, you know, we learn to abide and we're, um, we're growing in, the, in, in that respect and that maturity and that relationship. And that's what we do, that's what we teach here, is, is how to abide and stay in peace. And we come across certain, certain areas where, you know, not everything that we go through is, is, is a, you know, every nasty thing that, that happens in our life is because it's a demon. And, and um, it's not necessarily every time just our flesh, which it is most of the time, guys. It's our own flesh. We don't, we don't have to blame anybody else, really. Sometimes, though, and what, what the Lord was speaking to me just recently was, there's this one sentence in the, in the Song, of Sol uh, Song of Solomon, Song of Songs, whatever you want to say it. And, I, and I, I'm not a huge Song of Songs buff or theologian by any means, but this one sentence stood out for me this week, and I, and I wanted to share it. In Song of Songs 2.15, it says, catch the, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Totally pulling that out of context, but the way, the way that God showed it to me was, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Not only will we learn how to abide, but we still have to do our part, right? We didn't, I didn't just get, you know, three or four, <laughs> how many kids do we have now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we just, we, I just didn't get married and have, you know, four or five, six, seven kids. Feels like seven kids sometimes. <laughs> just so that I could say, hey, God, thank you for the, for the, for the presents. I'm going to stay in bed all day. You take care of the kids. Thanks, man. You don't, we, we don't do that. We, we, there, there's a responsibility that we have that in, in our own Christian walk, in dealing with our own needs and, and, and things in us that, that, that need taken care of. Um, but we are working with him. So we do have the grace to do it. He gives us the grace to, to, to help with the kids when, we, when we're at our wit's end and, and what have you. There. But we still have to do our part in in our Christian walk 
um, and I don't know if we, we said that just that way last week, but the way he was explaining the, the, he, the way that God explained to me the little foxes, um, there was a, there, this time of, of just an onslaught. It felt like an onslaught of the enemy just battling against us, and everything we did was just like so much resistance. Everything was so difficult. And, and that was just recently. And, and you know, with the, the negativity of all the, all the media and all this stuff that's going on, and, and this is outside of that. There's, there's, there was this pressure on some of the pastors and, and people in the church, as far as what I was, you know, that we, we talked to, had a lot of the same things. And, he, and the Lord was calling them little foxes to me. He said, those are little foxes, and you need to, you need to, you need to get them for us. You need to catch them. You need to get rid of them. They're the little stinky attitudes that we have when we wake up in the morning and we don't want to do whatever. Oh, it's a bad, it's a Monday. I don't want to get up. I don't want to face that person at work. It's all those little attitudes, and, and, and that's not how we're supposed to live. He doesn't want us to live that way. If, it, if we would just catch the little foxes and deal with them as they come up, he has a promise, and the promise is that vineyard. It's ours already. He says it. It's our vineyard. You go tend to those foxes, please. You do the work. You do that work. And it'll be what you want it to be, what it was intended to be. What's really cool as far as the prophetic side of it is that I think that he's Not all, like I said, not all resistance is demonic. Not all resistance is, is, is the enemy. Not all resistance is just our flesh. But some resistance is due to moving forward and advancing and clearing land. I mean, there's a resistance in moving a boulder out of the way so that you could flatten the land and expand, right? And that's where, and that's where the Lord was telling me where we're at. As a church body, as pastors here, he wants us to be able to start uprooting those trees and getting rid of the boulders, tilling the ground, and expanding, getting ready for the expansion because it's already ours. It's ours already. He gave it to us, whatever this is. What's really cool about it, though, is he's not telling me what it is to its full extent. <laughs> um, but he called it new anointings. New anointings, new, there's going to be new, a new, new flavor of the Spirit that's going to be ruling and running in the church and that we're going to be a part of. It's the pressure that we have to do right now that, that, that's like the removal of the, the, the rocks and the trees and the leveling of the land and making it all perfect that is building maturity for what He's going to give us. That has never... We have never experienced it necessarily before. It's going to be new to us as a church family. It's going to be new to us as the church leaders. Whatever these anointings are, he is already perfecting in us, which doesn't mean it's perfect. It means it's, he's coming, he's, he's making it growing into a, a maturity, right, in us so that we can handle the anointing that's coming, the different things that God's bringing. It felt like this, it was like the, you know, stretch the, stretch the, the tent pegs out further type of thing. Take more territory. The land is already yours. The vineyard's already yours. You need to work for it, though, because I need to see you mature so that you could carry it. Um, anyway, I'm, not, I'm neither here nor there, but that was the Lord, what the Lord was speaking to me prophetically this week. And, in fact, even for our family, I was like, we... The, we're trying to find a, a, a you know new place to stay, to live because our, our family is getting bigger and we need it we need that bigger house and especially now that I mean we've been in this quarantine for so long <laughs> that uh, we really know now we know we need a bigger house um, for sure and so we've been really praying about that and just laying it on the altar we really want you know a place where the kids could have a little bit of land to, to run around outside because we don't want them in the house anymore. <laughs> no, we want them outside. We want to, you know, sorry, I don't mean, to. they're not bad kids. The, the, but we want, we, there's certain things that we, we desire, that our heart's desire is for, for the larger home and everything. And, and that's when the Lord was speaking to me this particular thing personally to us, to, to Gwen and I, 
and and what was what was funny was is we were sitting there on the couch the other day and an earthquake went through the middle of our house nowhere else in, in the, it, it just it was we looked at each other and we're like she woke, it woke the baby up. I mean, it was legitimate. There was something happened underneath our house. And, and then nobody ever, you know, we, we checked, and no, there wasn't any anywhere per se. Um, but then we read the, the, there was a prophecy, I, I can't remember who it was, Doug that Addison. Doug Addison said something about the, the shifting under the earth and, and what, what God's preparing to do. And what's really cool about that, too, is <laughs> that... Um, it really flowed in together with what I was feeling as far as the, the pressure on the expansion um, and, and the, and the um, building of your, your uh, anointing at, in the process, right? And the new anointings that are coming because it was like the birth pain. It, it's like the birth pains, right? This is, this is what we felt like we were going through for so many weeks. Um, and, and I'm not complaining. I'm just saying it's just like, I thought it was the onslaught of the enemy, but now I have a whole different perspective as he needs us to go through some things so that we have the ability to carry it, so that we have the ability to carry his anointing, whatever that, that anointing is. And so I yield now to those things. I, I, I had to yield to, to, to actually coming up here today to him because I had no notes. I had tons of things I wanted to say, but I think I'm doing all right. I think it's God, it's God, but, but I had to, I had to give it up, and, and um, that's, I think it's just, it's a new, there's a new fresh anointing coming for his people, there's too much of the, the darkness and the gloom and the doom, and right now I believe that we're in the Isaiah 60, we're in the, in the arise shine for your light has come, it doesn't matter how dark it is, the sun and the moon aren't going to be there anymore, it says in the, right, in, in, in Isaiah 60, but I'm going to be the light, he says. It's like, I feel like that. And, and I also am waiting for those camels because those cam I've been waiting for those camels to come with, the, with, the, with the, the wealth of the nations come back to the, to the church. For about eight years now, I've been waiting for that, ever since Chuck Pierce prophesied it, I believe. I think it was Chuck Pierce. Can't remember for sure. But... I think we're in there. I think we're in the Isaiah 60 time. It doesn't matter how dark it gets outside. He's going to shine the light that's, li that's brighter. And that's, and that's where we're going to be. But it does, take the process, it does take the process of you taking out all this garbage that's coming, all the negativity and all the, the political garbage and all this stuff that's happening right now in the world with the coronavirus and everything, and set it aside and stop listening to it, paying attention, giving it too much thought. And, and look for what God is doing. He's always doing something on the opposite end of the spectrum that is going to affect millions of people. There's, there's, always, there's always the opposite. In, in the darkest, darkest time of the church, even you ask, ask Jennifer, the church history, it blows my mind. When you see what, what Satan did over here and got the, the enemy to do over here, God on the other side of the bee was doing so much something else that impacted the world in the in the nation so anyway that's a, that's about all I have for today <laughs> do you have anything honey <laughs> I was gonna have my wife rescue me if I if I couldn't um, if I couldn't if I missed anything because our, our lack of sleep and everything we, we're thinking that our brain cells are we need some regeneration in the spirit but I just wanted to sh I just wanted to share that that one that one pr prophetic, because I know the man is rooted in love. You could tell he he loves the people the way that God does. And and there's just, like I said there's there's so much that contrasts. But it has to be rooted in love. All right. Let's just close with a prayer for the little foxes. Uh, I remember uh, that was one of my big revelations when I was young was that, you know, most people say the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that, and the devil's doing this. Most of the time it's your flesh beating yourself up. The devil just standing there watching you beat yourself up. 
So, Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, the little foxes, we're going to deal with these little foxes to further and further release the anointing of God with us and that we're going to grow in grace. Every baby step of obedience builds authority. Every baby step. So every little fox that we can conquer builds anointing and authority to accomplish the purposes for which God ordained for us from the foundation of the earth. So we thank you, God, that it's... Um, a, it was like four letters that, that God used for me to memorize that process. And I re memorize it as Jada, J-A-D-A. -A. No, it's not some, I'm not speaking in tongues. Jada was understand your jurisdiction, J. In that jurisdiction, God expects you to expand the A, your authority, the rule of Jesus. Let the peace of God rule in your jurisdiction. If peace doesn't rule on your job, in your home, in your neighborhood, where, wherever you go to work, church, if Jesus isn't ruling, you, you've got little foxes there to get out of the way. You don't just run. You deal with the foxes. Jurisdiction, authority, and anointing. What takes place then? How do you know if you're accomplishing anything? D, displacement. True spiritual warfare displaces the enemy. When all of a sudden you see that which was troublesome, that which was a, a, an oppressive, repetitive area has now been removed, now you're ready for the last to advance. Displacement isn't for you to just relax. Displacement is now moving forward and upward. That's sanctification, forward and up like a stairway. So, Father, in the days ahead, we're going to move in greater anointing, and we're going to advance the cause of God. And he sees us with all that love. By golly, we're going to start removing the little foxes that we might shine brighter in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit forgive123.com.